Welcome to the Make Ready with the Experts podcast. I'm your host, Fernando Coelho. We're here at Pantio Studios bringing you the very best from in and around the firearms industry, covering topics like guns, gear, firearms training, self-defense, and so much more. Everything from industry insights about the latest gear and training techniques, to hunting, survival, and empty hands. But this isn't just about the guns, folks. This is about the stories. The military, law enforcement, and civilian stories of heroics protecting our country, fellow citizens, friends, and neighbors. MakeReady.tv is the official website of Pantio Productions and features over 5,000 segments from world-famous instructors. With new video titles added each month, MakeReady.tv is widely known as the Netflix of firearms training. However, we really do go beyond that. We have survival series, we have empty hands, we have edged weapons, we cover armorer skills, we've done documentaries, even medical, and hunting. With your subscription, you will have access to an extensive library of videos. To be quite honest, we got a lot. Be sure to visit MakeReady.tv and subscribe today to stream our exclusive content to any device, anywhere, anytime. This is content that just may save your life or the life of someone you love. Hey folks, we're going to be with Mike Boyle today. We're lucky to be filming two days with Mike Boyle on a uh, project we've been wanting to do for a long time. We've been wanting to do a video on snubby revolvers. You know, those little things that have a cylinder that spin. Most of you probably have never even seen one. But we decided that it was time to finally get Mike down from the communist state of New Jersey and do a video here in South Carolina on snubby revolvers, sponsored by Kimber. Yes, Kimber does make revolvers. So stay tuned. I think you're going to like this. Hey folks, Fernando Coelho here with Pantio Productions, and I am sitting here with longtime friend, Mike Boyle. We are in the middle of filming an instructional video on snubbies, snubby revolvers, something that some of you may know out there. So, Mike Boyle, gun writer extraordinaire, legend. Is that about right? Yeah, I think you nailed it. You think that was it? You nailed it. That was pretty good, I mean. I, I think I used to say that back in the old days, like in the ammo days, when that you could were be. writing articles. That could be, about your stuff. But, boy, I was kissing your ass at that point because I needed articles. <laughs> we go back, way back. I mean, let's see now. Uh, you were writing articles on Triton going back to like... Early 90s, perhaps? Uh, yeah, I think like 94, 95 mm -hmm. was the first stuff that you, you wrote about us on. And um, I'll never forget. You were doing an ammo roundup, and it was uh, Remington, it was Winchester, it was a little bit of everybody. Mm -hmm. And you gave a tagline for us that helped put us in the map. It was equal to or better than the big boys. And I was thinking, holy shit, I'm going to have to pay him a lot of money for that now. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm still waiting. <laughs> but that was, that was very cool. And uh, yeah, so it's been, I remember going out to Jersey. Uh, bringing gelatin mm -hmm. to do demos with you. They didn't lock you up. No, no, I brought gelatin. I didn't bring guns. Uh, brought ammo, though, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I remember those, those days. I mean, so, what have you been doing in your senior years now? Well, I retired from my job uh, some years ago. And since I have no other... Um, skills. Uh, I can't do somebody's taxes. I can't lay tile. I, I can't wire your house, anything like that. Um, so uh, I work part time and what I was doing before, uh, use of force instruction, firearms instruction. Uh, I work at my old job uh, doing, imagine this, firearms training. Mm -hmm. uh, I work at the police academy uh, training uh, uh, new folks to the world of law enforcement. Um, we do instructor level stuff there. Uh, in another um, uh, a county training center, I do uh, my own classes uh, on, on various different firearms topics. Uh, I was traveling around the country for a, a, an instructor group a while back, uh, doing um, basically instructor level training and in various topics. We called it a master instructor development program. 
where uh, I would bring someone in to talk about handgun, somebody would talk about shotgun, somebody would talk about rifle, and uh, whatever topic was there that nobody didn't want to talk about, I would probably end up talking about that one. So uh, that's, that's kept me busy uh, for the last several years. Okay. So what have you seen from the old days to today? What, is, what have you seen change when it comes to concealed carry, uh, self-defense? What, what's, been, what's been changing? Well, uh, the technology has clearly been changing. We've seen uh, uh, a move away from traditional double single action pistols. Mm -hmm. uh, in my travels uh, around the country and in my own classes locally, uh, it's rare to encounter a traditional double action single action gun. We mostly striker fired guns and occasional 1911. Uh, no revolvers at all. Um, so as far as the technology goes, that's, that's one big change right there. Uh, the other big thing I, uh, I encounter, or we're all starting to encounter a lot now, are red dot optics. Mm -hmm. um, red dot optics have been around uh, for some years. I think Aimpoint, I forget exactly when they marketed their first red dot, probably back in the 70s. And I can recall probably around the end of the 20th century, early 21st century, uh, people putting these on pistols. Uh, but there's a lot involved in milling guns and all that kind of thing to make this thing fit. Uh, one thing we've seen in recent years is all the major manufacturers, whether it's Glock, whether it's SIG, Smith & Wesson, H&K, Beretta, are all making pistols with removable plates on the slide we can fit a red dot optic. Um, I think the, uh, uh, the change is going to be as dramatic as the switch from revolvers to pistols from iron sights to red dot optics. Uh, I'm a self-confessed caveman, and uh, I, I'm slow to adapt to new technologies, if you would. It took me a while to warm up to pistols. Um, clearly, that's a better choice for law enforcement and probably for a lot of uh, armed citizens. Uh, red dot optics is, uh, is a whole different ball game. And my analogy would be, it's like getting on the plane and flying to, to England and getting in a car and driving on the left-hand side of the road. Yes, um, good, good point. With iron sights, we look at the front sight. With a red dot optic, you look at the target. And you know, 50 years of shooting iron sights is a hard habit to break, looking for that front sight per se. So uh, for me, that, that's been a big, a big deal. Okay, I, I went to a red dot optic class last week. Uh, I was probably the oldest and the slowest in the class, but I think I'm finally getting the hang of it. It's going to be a while, but uh, I think uh, that is something we will all be looking into in the future. Um, another thing I saw at the SHOT Show um, uh, this year in 2020, as I was cruising the aisles and looking at the new pistols that were introduced, one thing I'm not seeing anymore, I'm not seeing 45s, I'm not seeing 40s. Mm. Everything but everything seems to be a 9 millimeter. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm a, a, a refugee from the baby boomer generation. And back then, whether it was uh, the car you drove, <clears throat> the women you went out with, or the guns you shot, bigger was better, right? Bigger right. was better. Right. Um, so uh, it was, I was not a hard sell, and you know, 45s are the way to go, and this and that. And, you know, around... 1990, 91, when the FBI, FBI came out with their test protocol, handgun ammunition, ammunition the, the, the bigger bores, the 45 and the 10 millimeter, they, they were king of the hill. And our friends in the Bureau were saying, you guys have to carry these things. And now the pendulum has swung back the other way. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I was at an instructor seminar and there was an agent from the FBI there who was involved in firearms instruction. And uh, we, we knew there was some stuff going on but he, he told us that our, their studies illustrate that people shooting the nine millimeters uh, were able to shoot them at a much higher standard than the people shooting the 40s and the 45s. When they factored in the disparity of performance, they felt that across the board for shooters of average ability, they were better served with nine millimeters. So what I'm seeing in the law enforcement world is this. Those same agencies that swapped their nine millimeters for 40s and 45s 30 years ago are now coming back and buying nine millimeters. That is something that I've been trying to wrap my hands around because let's go back to the ammo days, okay? Early 90s, 
early mid 90s when I first started mm -hmm. Triton. Back then, nine millimeter. We used to call it the nine minimum. Uh, nine millimeter. Uh, yes, yes. Um, mouse cartridges like the 380, mm -hmm. the 32, uh, uh, the 25 auto. Right. So nine millimeter was the minimum that you would go with. 40 Smith & Wesson was brand new. 357, well, there was still 41 Action Express mm -hmm. that was out there. You had 357 SIG, brand new. 356 TSW, nine by 21 and a half. Mm -hmm. um, but really, you had 9, 40, and 45. Those were the three um, uh, semi auto cartridges that were the big deal. And I, I remember the testing that we would do in gelatin, and we would shoot, God, we would shoot so much gelatin. And you, as a writer, one of the few that I knew that actually shot gelatin as well. Mm -hmm. And the nine millimeter performed, the 40 Smith & Wesson performed, and depending on the load, performed better. Mm -hmm. The 45, unless you're running ball, performed. And somehow, here we are today, these years later. Now I hear the excuses. Oh, well bullets have gotten much better. The designs have gotten better. Engineers have done better. Uh, I, I know these engineers. I beg to differ. There were really good nine millimeters back in the day, plus B plus. Mm -hmm. Pretty much every plus B plus nine millimeter worked, you know, in gelatin. Um, I still think it's not, I think it's where you're, what you're talking about. It's, it's, it's the ease of use. It's easier to shoot a nine millimeter than a 45. Mm -hmm. I think law enforcement agencies are going more towards what's easier for their officers to shoot versus what's the better cartridge for them to run. That could be. You know? That could be. Having been in the uh, law enforcement training game for more years than I care to remember, um, you know, we hear this stuff about defunding the police yeah. and, and, and that sort of stuff. If anything, we should be increasing the funding. Um, in, in most areas, what passes for training um, doesn't make the cut, you know? And this is true whether we're talking the military or law enforcement. The goal is to get the largest amount of people up to min the minimum standard with the least amount of effort and expense. Mm -hmm. And that's the way police training works. And I can say by observing this scene for uh, damn near 40 years, I would tell you that, you know, a lot of agencies, uh, big and small, they go out to the range. And if Johnny or Sally can scratch out the minimum passing score on the handgun qualification course, that's good enough. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to do anything beyond that because they're, quote, qualified. Qualified for what? I'm not really sure. Um, but that's pretty much the state of uh, uh, affairs in, in many areas right now. I'm not saying there aren't agencies out there who do go the extra yard and do really train their folks to a high standard. But uh, sad to say, um, that's not often the case. Um, being active and, and recruit entry-level training, um, very often these folks get a mere 40 hours uh, on the range. And by the way, a few weeks before they were butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers. Uh, they didn't have a clue about a gun. We put them on a FATS machine or something like that. Uh, we give them the papal blessing and lo and behold, they're, they're qualified to go out and fight crime. And maybe they shoot these things once or twice a year for the rest of their career. Right. Then we wonder when they get themselves in a jam and they made the wrong decision, you know, we were, we're sitting there and pointing, you know, wagging the finger at them, when really uh, the, the administrators who allow this to continue are the ones who need to take a hard look in the mirror. Mm, I agree. I agree with you. I Just agree. getting back to what you talked about, uh, the 9s versus the 40s and the 45s, uh, I did this for an article a few weeks ago from one of the law enforcement magazines. <clears throat> I gathered up uh, a couple boxes of um, service quality ammunition in 9, 40, and 45. And these were typical bullet weights. Uh, for example, the 9 was a 124 Hydroshock. Uh, I think the, uh, the 40 was a 180 grain uh, HST. Uh, the 40 was, uh, excuse me, 45 was a, uh, a Black Hills uh, 230 grain uh, hollow point. None of this stuff is plus P or plus P plus, or just standard velocity loads. I took three Glock pistols and uh, I had my capable assistant go out and we set up uh, a drill where I put a, uh, an IPSC target, okay, with the, the A zone in the center of the target. And I wanted to fire at a relatively fast cadence, but not so fast that I'd be missing or, or throwing a lot of shots or whatnot. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to shoot what I would call a game speed, not mm -hmm. qualification speed. 
So what we did is I went out and I set this target at three yards and at five yards and at seven yards. At the three yard line, all from a ready position, uh, a Glock 17, a Glock 22, and a Glock 21, all starting from a, a, a low ready position. On a tone from an electronic timer, I went up and tried to put a hit, or hits, I should say, in the A zone. At the uh, three yard line, one hand only, two shots. Five yard line, two hands on the gun, but three shots. At the seven yard line, it was four shots, uh, two hands on the gun. Mm -hmm. What was interesting, um, no doubt about it, I shot the nine millimeter faster, okay? Uh, my score, was the weakest out of all those. I, I, I'd like to say I put all the hits in the A zone. That wasn't the case. Uh, on all these, all the guns I fired, uh, we had some in the C just outside the A, just by a little bit. And, and mind you, I'm, I'm trying to, to shoot at a, a fairly lively cadence. Uh, I'm certainly not a world-class shooter anymore. Not that I ever was, but we've probably taken a step back. But uh, this is probably faster, certainly much faster than most cops shoot their pistols on a qualification course. Uh, we had set up par times. Uh, we're pretty lively, like, you know, one and a half seconds or, or whatnot. And uh, when I worked it out, the old Comstock scoring, where you took your score and divide it by time, the 9 miller was indeed the winner. But oddly enough, I shot the 45 the best, accuracy-wise. And really, the difference in, in the times was insignificant. So uh, make of that what you will. Now, mind you, it was one test with one shooter mm -hmm. um, and under very controlled conditions. Uh, would someone else uh, do a little better, perhaps? Uh, worse, different results, certainly. But uh, I don't know. I, I've never felt that uh, a 40 or 45 was a quote a hard kicker. But yet again, uh, I shoot a gun probably a couple times a week, every week. Uh, but lo and behold, other people may come to a different conclusion. So I, I don't know where this is going to lead to. But uh, I, I think for those who are non-enthusiast, uh, which probably is most cops, Right. Uh, nine's probably not a bad idea, you know. Uh, for those who can, uh, sh you know, uh, achieve a higher standard, uh, not not a difficult gun to shoot. And we have a, a mix on my job of nine millimeters and 45s. We don't have any 40s. Okay. So there, there's some folks that have Glock 21s and some that have Glock 17s or 19s. So uh, in the perfect world, it'd be like. Uh, uh, whether you want to wear a helmet with your motorcycle, let those who ride decide. <laughs> but unfortunately, when you work for a public agency, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, people who train to the armor level and things like that, and we have to maintain parts. And there was, for example, we have Glock pistols. I'm not saying they're the only pistol or the best pistol or anything like that, but they, they've worked fairly well for us. They're easy to maintain, uh, you know, uh, so simple, like even a caveman can do it. That's me. And, uh, you know, we have a, an inventory of parts and whatnot. But if we were to have different models and different sizes and different calibers, logistically, it would be a nightmare. No, I get so, that. I get that. Uh, again, if you're training large numbers of people, uh, many of whom who really don't want to be there, um, you know, different aptitudes, skill levels, genders, hand sizes. Uh, a nine millimeter is not a train wreck. Um, but I, I'm going to stop short to say that it's the hammer of Thor. All right, and no doubt the better loads I've seen uh, anymore. Uh, through a heavy clothing uh, barrier into ballistic gel, and will typically expand about one and a half times diameter. But now, here's the other thing I've noticed. Everyone is talking about the training out there today, which is critical. Training is always critical. But one thing that I did see that back in the day, mid to late 90s, even the early 2000s, everyone talked about ammunition performance and writers would do articles of comparing multiple brands within say nine millimeter mm -hmm. and they would see which rounds are doing what in gelatin then they would test 40 they would test 45 and sometimes they would test them against each other mm -hmm. yep. but there was a lot more attention to ammunition performance and what worked and what didn't work mm -hmm. back in the day today i don't see that anymore yeah well i'll give you my view on that it's a matter of economics as far as the magazines are concerned. Um, I've written for a couple of editors over the year, some good, some not so good. Uh, it all comes down to who's buying the ads, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I suggest it uh, to the powers to be, at one now defunct magazine, that, hey, I'd be happy to write uh, about ammunition for you on, on a regular basis. And we could get ballistic gel, we could shoot the stuff, chronograph it, shoot it for accuracy, whatever you want to do. And uh, I would support it by, uh, one of the guys who was a big player in one of the ammo companies, he thought this was a grand idea as well. 
but uh, they don't want to go in that direction. And, and my thought, uh, you know, we all have a couple of guns, and every now and again we buy a new one, but we always have to buy ammunition. Right. And, you know, one, one of the uh, uh, issues, and I'm, I know it's on your mind as well as mine, you know, the FBI had their, their protocol they established back in, I guess, the early 90s, about 12 to 18 inches of penetration, all this nonsense, and yeah. through these various barriers. Uh, I would tell you, if I was shooting through sheetrock or something like that, I'd probably get indicted. You know? Yeah, but, yeah. But I, I think I, I make a diff, a, uh, a diff, there, there's a big difference, I should say, and what level of performance you're looking for for a uniformed law enforcement officer, troopers on the highway, for example, who may have to regularly shoot through windshield glass or sheet metal or whatnot, or versus armed citizens or even off-duty coppers who are walking around who encounter someone at this distance. Do I really need a round that's going to penetrate 18 inches of ballistic gelatin? Probably right. not. Right. Probably not. And, you know, in my mind for years, uh, when, when I uh, evaluated ammunition for personal use, I wanted to see what it would do through heavy clothing. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of stuff out there uh, in the not so distant past as being touted as the greatest thing since whatever, you know, uh, but when you shot it through heavy clothing, that hollow cavity would clog with uh, clothing fibers or what have you. It would behave very much like ball ammo. Um, I can remember uh, a, uh, uh, a, a, an issue some years ago, probably about 10 years ago, we had one of the major ammo manufacturers show up at uh, one of my ranges, my range in North Jersey, and we were concerned about um, bears. And at the time we had nine millimeter, we had some access to some 45 pistols, and we took ballistic gelatin and covered it with a bear skin from a freshly killed bear. Okay. Now here's something different. Uh, oddly enough, and this is one of the the, the major manufacturers, who, who, this is the greatest 45 ammo since all time, we shot it through the bear hide, very much like ball ammo. It just filled up with, with all that bear fat and hair, did not expand. Oddly enough, the 9mm outperformed it. Uh, I thought that was, that was kind of different, you know. But uh, I, I've seen all kinds of things fail and whatnot, but um, yet again, uh, I, I wouldn't say because it's optimum for... Uh, the FBI or general law enforcement use, it's, it's the best load for personal defense. No, I, I, I agree. And, and I remember going back to around 1998 when the INS, before Homeland Security, mm -hmm. when the INS decided to have their own protocols. I remember that. And I was there with Tom Brzezinski, inventor of the Hydroshock, Starfire, EFMJ, more bullets than, he's invented more bullets than everyone else combined. Mm -hmm. I remember sitting there with the folks from Remington, Winchester, um, CCI Spear, uh, we had Corbon and myself there from Triton, and we had Tom Brzezinski. And I, I remember Alan Corzine specifically, he was with Winchester at the right. time, with, with a Black Talon. man. Uh, and, and Black Talon man. Yeah. And he said to the INS folks, in short, basically, I don't know why we're going through this, you could just use the FBI protocols. Yeah. to develop, to, to come up with your own 40 Smith & round that you want. Because mm -hmm. they were going from 357 Magnum to 40 Smith & Watson at the time. And I, I'll never forget, John Jacobs uh, from the INS told him straight up, we're not the FBI. Mm -hmm. We are shooting people coming across the border wearing a Mexican suitcase. And I was like, what the hell is a Mexican suitcase? And it turned out it was multiple layers of clothing. Right, right. So basically our equivalent of that four layer of denim test that right. I would do in the ammo business and you did mm -hmm. as a writer, that's what they were up against. They were up against heavy clothing and where the 357 Magnum 125 grain semi jacket yep. hollow point worked perfectly, yep. the 40 Smith & Wesson started to fail. So they wanted something. They wanted 180s or, and they went to 155. They went to 155. Which worked like gangbusters. Because they were using the FBI protocol and mm -hmm. the 180 and they're realizing, wait a minute, this stuff is not working. Mm -hmm in heavy clothing. Yep. So all of a sudden, the FBI's protocol, which is good for the FBI, wasn't good for the INS. Mm -hmm. To me, in the ammo business at the time, I thought the INS protocol made more sense for the civilian, because right. you're dealing with heavy clothing. Not gypsum board, not metal, not glass. Yep. And, you know. and correct me if I'm wrong, but in the INS protocol, uh, it was weighted, where, where greater emphasis was put on things like heavy clothing versus on yes. less likely 
and depth of penetration was reduced. Yeah. They didn't want mm -hmm. a 16 inch block of gel. If you had a 16 inch block of gel and the bullet exited that, mm -hmm. the FBI was okay with it. Mm -hmm. They would say, if I remember correctly, it was like between 12 and 14 inches of penetration. That was their window that they wanted. Yeah. So I just remember the, the fanboys that were in that room for the FBI protocol, they weren't happy. The others, you yeah. know, we were understanding what needed to be done. I, I think it's important to, to point out at that time, the Border Patrol INS was shooting more bad guys than all the other federal agencies combined. Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, going across the border in the same scenarios, yes. And uh, they were not just outgunned, they were by themselves most of the time. Yeah. So, uh, and I remember they ended up going to the 45th and Weston 155 and where they are today, They're, they went to the nine. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I, I don't get it. Um, I, think, I think the training is still critical. Um, I think people still need to put rounds down range and I know being able to draw from a holster and engage a target and have great groups is, is, is important, but it still comes down to, is the round that you're carrying going to work out of your particular gun? Because that, we don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, to your point, you mentioned it uh, while we were filming. You can buy a lot number of ammunition from a specific manufacturer running through your pistol a year later by the same round and they've tweaked it and they've changed it, they did something and now it's not got, the, it doesn't have the same velocity. Yep. In this or they changed the bullet. Instance, yeah, in this particular instance that I mentioned, uh, my buddy had a, a, a Glock 42 he used for extreme discrete carry and whatnot. Um, and he was, uh, he was shooting this, this thing and he, otherwise reliable pistol, never had a problem with it, suddenly a problem. And you notice when the, the empty cases eject, they were just about falling out of the gun. Mm -hmm. And uh, did not make him happy. So when he checked the lot numbers, this is what he came up with. And we can go on and on about uh, where manufacturers have changed specs on ammunition. Um, you know, prior to uh, Gold Dots, you know, Spear made a, a line of hollow point ammunition. And uh, they made a 200 grain um, uh, 45, the flying, the flying, flying ashtray. Ash yeah. <laughs> and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, at some point in time, that, that was the hot load in 45 ACP. Yes. A lot of people like that. Yes. And uh, suddenly Sig Sauer comes out with a Sig 220. And that gun was having a, a or excuse me, that round was having a problem in the gun and they changed the design of the bullet ever so slightly. Mm -hmm. So it didn't work in the other guns anymore. Yep. Um, another, another case in point was uh, uh, P7s, HK P7. Uh, one of the more innovative guns of the latter half of the, the 20th century. People either love them or hate them. New Jersey State Police had them for years. And uh, it was designed around 115 and 124 grain bullets, not 147s. 147s came about after that. Mm -hmm. And clearly, uh, H and K, Heckler and Koch, had put out an advisory: do not use 147 grain ammunition with this. Again, my buddy, same guy with the Glock, shooting his uh, P7, and Hornady Critical Defense, Critical Duty, I should say, 135 grain loads ran before. Well, guess what? They don't run anymore. And the reason being, they changed something ever so slightly, just a hair longer. So that bullet in the case makes that cartridge just about as long as a 147. So no go in, a, in, a, in a, an HMK. Now I realize it's an odd duck and not many people are gonna have that problem. But if you shoot an auto pistol, I think I mentioned this on video, I would not feel comfortable unless I fired at least 200 rounds through that gun without any stoppages whatsoever. Hmm. And today, when you look at the price of ammo, or yeah. even worse, the availability, the availability of ammo. Try to get the ammo, uh, much less, yeah. That, that's a problem. No, you, you have a good point because unless we're going to go back to the Clint Smith days when he first started Thunder Ranch and said everyone should use ball ammo, I remember that, mm -hmm. which when I was making hollow point ammunition at the time, I'm like, that's sacrilegious. What are you saying? Don't do that. Yeah. But to that point, I remember talking with Tom Brzezinski, the inventor of the Hydroshock, and he was telling me about how many iterations there were of the Hydroshock when it came to profile of the, of the bullet, mm -hmm. where it was working fine, mm -hmm. but then we're having feeding issues. So they improved the feed, but made the bullet perform worse. So mm -hmm. they have to change the bullet again. So yeah. it, it's safe to say that a, a bullet may have changed in one year, two years, three years. You may have ammunition sitting around that works in your gun, but you buy a brand new box with the same load and the feeding profile is different, you know? So, that, that is a problem. And you know, back to, there should be, if I can pick up Cigar Aficionado magazine, okay? 
and read reviews of cigars every month over, over quality of cigar, draw, and all that, and they rate them, there ought to be every month articles coming out where they're rating ammunition yeah. and giving ammunition uh, an A, a B, a C. And you know what? If the ammunition company don't like it, you know, test the ammo again, yeah. you know? But ammo, ammo is one of the most important things when it comes to right. defending your life. Mm -hmm. you're, not throwing, you're not throwing the pistol at the person, you're not beating them over the head with it until you run out of ammo. Yeah. So well, the the, uh, the bullet does the heavy lifting when yes, you get down to it. Yes, it does. Yes, and, and I, I get into it a lot of times with our instructors because I, I do believe shot placement's critical, but so is incapacitation time. Mm. Going back to the ammo days, uh, the great goat papers, the Strasburg tests, mm. remember that? Oh, yeah. Everything was about incapacitation time. Uh, the moment the bullet impacted the uh, intended target, how quickly did that target become incapacitated? Was it... Five seconds? Was it 10 seconds? Was it 30 seconds? The difference was, are you alive or are you dead along with the guy you just shot mm -hmm. who was trying to kill you? Yep. So, I, I don't know. I, I think there needs to be more emphasis on the ammunition performance. I think there should be more emphasis on ammunition testing. And I think there should be more emphasis on the civilian buying a handgun to defend themselves mm -hmm. should be more worried about the ammunition they're putting in that gun. Right than the type of gun they just bought. Mm -hmm. So, but that's just me preaching and bitching because I was in the ammo business. Imagine that. You know? <laughs> so now, tell me, you're still living in New Jersey. I do. When are you gonna be moving down here to the South? Oh boy, <laughs> you'll have to convince my wife. Oh, She's come on. She's a Jersey girl. Come on, you, you'll have to get her out of Jersey. Come on, it's gotten more communist than California. Mm -hmm. I think, I think we need to get you down to like maybe Somerville area, Charleston. We'll check it out. You know, we'll have you come down and, and you need to bring her down. We need to get you around here and check out the area and, and get you down here and start teaching classes here at the range. And, you know, we could be doing classes on bourbon. I think we should do classes on bourbon. Bourbon. Yeah, yeah. Bourbon selection. I'll be reading Cigar Aficionado. Yes. Okay. Yes, we could do that here at the range. Yeah, I smoke about two cigars a year. We could fix that. Okay. Yeah, we could definitely fix that. Yeah. I mean, I remember. White Owl, so I know better. Oh, White Owl. Jesus, really? That, that, that's that's, ugh, that's sacrilegious. Well, when I, when I was about 12 years old, we'd go up in the treehouse, put a Yoo-Hoo and a White Owl and a jelly donut, and we were in high cotton. <laughs> <laughs> the makings of a police officer. Yeah, <laughs> so, what else are you going to be doing now? Are you going to continue with the training? Well, uh, I've got a couple of miles left on my odometer. Uh, all good things come to an end. And I, I know physically, uh, I certainly don't move as fast. I know I don't hear, I don't see things as well, but we're gonna stay in this game as long as we can. Um, you know, I, I find at times, and it's a Dave Spaulding quote, when you can't meet your own standard, that's when it's time to pack it in. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how close we are with that. I, I know there's some things that I, I would feel uncomfortable coming out and doing some kind of high-speed ninja, you know, carbine class, you know. Uh, but I can back it up a pace and do, uh, you know, uh, armed citizen with a rifle or patrol rifle for common road cops. But uh, all that high-speed ninja stuff is in my rearview mirror right now. But uh, uh, I still feel a little bit capable in teaching a, you know, a shotgun, a rifle, uh, or a handgun class uh, to the great onwash masses. Uh, the snake eaters, they're going to have to find their own sensei to enlighten them, I think, anymore. Not that I was, was that sensei, but... What about all these new people that are uh, buying guns ever well, since... Well, that's kind of interesting. I, I wrote a piece uh, uh, for one of the online magazines a while back, and uh, I put this thing together, and uh, <clears throat> when I talked to the editor, I said, you know, I was mistaken on that, because I heard this about April or so, uh, when I was writing this article initially, is they said in 2020, and mind you, this is back in April, at least two million people were, were first time gun owners. And my comment in the article is, they're not going duck hunting. They're not going duck hunting. They're watching the Communist News Network and seeing what's going on. And lo and behold, maybe I better get prepared myself. Mm -hmm. So um, I've heard more recently, you know, uh, throughout the summer, that number is not two million, probably closer to five million. That's a lot of guns, you know, tucked under, you know, the sofa, in a draw someplace, whatever, uh, with people really um, uh, not really prepared to use them. You know, there's, 
uh, it's a multi-dimensional thing. We not only have to have the skills to uh, use these things, we have to mentally prepare for uh, perhaps taking someone's life. And that's, uh, that's a difficult task. And, you know, in, in most states, um, you know, you, you go down, if, if there is a shooting test, uh, it's, and the instruction, you know, once again, very basic, uh, very basic shooting tests. Some states there isn't any at all. Mm. And, you know, you're, you're good to carry a gun in polite society. Uh, you know, I'm not going to sit here and, and talk about constitutional carry versus permit carry or any of that business. That's beyond the scope of our discussion. But there is an awful lot of people out there who could use some instruction. Unfortunately, uh, the hardest people to convince are probably American males. Uh, you know, they watch John Wayne and Clint Eastwood on TV, and they think, not a problem. Um, you know, I had similar illusions the first time I shot a handgun. This a piece of cake. You know, and, and shooting a handgun is, I don't want to say difficult, but uh, a little challenging. And shooting it when you're all stressed out is, like, more challenging than you can possibly believe. Mm -hmm. You know, I got through my entire uh, law enforcement career without firing a shot in anger. I trained people who did. Uh, and it's, it's tough stuff. It's tough stuff. So lo and behold, um, for those who are in the training game, there's a whole big audience out there, uh, that, that you can hopefully solicit and get over to your side of the fence and provide some instruction. Um, I, I've never really made an impact or made even an attempt to, uh, uh, work for the, uh, work on or with the armed citizen, uh, folks out there, apparently because of where I live, you know, uh, I can't do that. Yeah. Uh, uh, there are a few, uh, you know, private ranges and that sort of thing, but, uh, you know, most public ranges, you know, there's no drawing from the holster or right, right. any of this business. And, and God, if you had more than four people in New Jersey with guns in hand, they probably think you were, you know, some sort of right wing crazies and you'd probably get locked up. But no. uh, yet again, it's, it's, it's a wide open area. You know, friends of mine have, have made a pretty good living uh, you know, going out and doing that kind of stuff, uh, it just hasn't been for me. Um, not that I wouldn't do that, but, uh, I guess I'm a little late to that game right now. Uh, I continue to train, uh, cops, uh, at home and other places when requested to do so. Um, but that's where we're at right now. You're right. There's, uh, a lot of new gun owners. And the sad part is a lot of the ones that are out there now don't even know John Wayne. They yeah. know, they know John Wick. Yeah. And they know this, yeah, this new way of carrying a gun and they, they see all this crazy stuff, oh, it's Hollywood, mm -hmm. and they think all of a sudden they're gonna be able to do that. Where, But in real life, Keanu Reeves can really, really shoot a gun well. Yes, he can, yes, he can. Uh, and he's got a lot of practice. Oh, yeah. And these people that are buying guns right now, I, they're buying them for probably the right reasons, but they're yeah. not getting the training that they need. Well, they're sitting around watching old you know movies naked with their gun belts on and dry firing at the TV set, which is a, an interesting concept. But, uh, so that, that's actually a, an idea of a new video. Yeah, that could be. That, that could, could be, a, be. A, you and Dave Spaulding together doing that video. Uh, he'll probably come out with his tactical thong on. I, have, I know you're gonna get a mental picture of that. I think I have photos somewhere of that. Uh, I hope so. Yes, I think I do, I do. Yeah, um, yeah we do need to harass him okay. a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, we should have had his ass over here too, mm -hmm. but you know, yep. I think he's, he's too busy for us now in his retirement stages. We'll have, to, we'll have to call him tonight when we're having some bourbon and harass him. Okay. So. Sounds like a plan. Well, folks, I am here with Mike Boyle. It's been a pleasure hanging out and chatting. We're going to be filming again tomorrow, and we're going to be at it shooting gelatin and shooting revolvers and doing other fun Revol stuff. Most of those things that go round and round, right? Yeah, I just don't remember which way they go around. Yeah, well, some go this way and some go that way. So some, but do they go both ways? Ooh, that's a dangerous concept. That's, that's, that's a whole different thing. Have fun, folks. I will see you again. We'll be here at the podcast. Take Love, care. Love, peace, and happiness. <laughs> be sure to visit makeready.tv and subscribe today to stream our exclusive content to any device, anywhere, anytime. Patio.